Let's take a look at uh, Turning Point by Worthington Games. This is a Richard Berg game, and that's pretty much why I picked it up. Um, however, recently I was asking, hey, anybody you know of a game on uh, the Battle of Queenstown? This was a particularly interesting situation. And I was told, well, this series, uh, the Maneuver series, actually has a game on Queenstown. There was one other uh, series with a lot of plastic minis and stuff. It also does. I, I can't. I don't know of anything a little bit more detailed that does, though. Um, the goal of this series appears to be a very, very light treatment of uh, gunpowder battles. Uh, in well, in this particular scenario, in this particular box, you get Freeman's Farm, which is from the Battle of Saratoga. It's a small section in the battle but where a lot of the key fighting happened. And then Lundy's Lane, the bloodiest battle in uh, the War of 1812. And yeah, approximately the same kind of fighting is going on in both of these uh, eras. Granted, the Napoleonic era on Europe had some significant differences, but because of the terrain, etc., there's reasons uh, and the lack of horses. <laughs> And, and artillery and such not, there's reasons why uh, the colonial combat continued in about the same way uh, in War of 1812 as it did in a lot of ways in the Revolutionary. So for a simplified system, it certainly makes sense to cover them both with the same design. And, you know, uh, you have the same design working between uh, oh, Wellington's victory, Ney versus Wellington, and then uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, Battle of Monmouth in the S SPI days. Um, anyway, let's take a look at what this game is going to be. So my feeling from having read the rules once or twice, I can't remember rightly, I know I read it once recently, but I may have read them before, uh, is that this is very much an attempt to kind of bring a combat commander type feel to other arrows. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on your look, it's not going to be as detailed a game as Combat Commander. Uh, the cards don't have the same level, the same number of different purposes, but that may make things a little easier in general. Let's take a look at what we have to have about the game. Uh, first of all, we have the counters, which are pretty simple. Uh, indicate who's where, any setup information, uh, the unit ID, which is historical only, a strength point value, and then a facing arrow. Well. You know, I don't know what that's really needed for, but they're nice big counters. There's lots of room to put all kind of stuff in them. You'll also notice the board is squares instead of, it doesn't look like it's anything there, but now it's squares very faintly printed uh, as a grid instead of uh, hexes. Um, I would think brickwork staggered st uh, squares would work better, but whatever, you know. It is a fairly simplified game, so we don't know. Uh, and the icon on the counter kind of tells you what different units are. So cav obviously have horses, artillery have cannons. Uh, things like Indians or light infantry might have their own specified roles, so we'll get to them in a bit. You also have optional leaders in the Lundy's Lane game. We're doing Freeman's Farm first. I'll do both of them, I think. Uh, and then a bunch of li little informational counters disordered rallied and there's used on the back of some of these. Unfortunately they're not uh, set up in a way that you can tell what's on the back of any given counter so you might have to fish around and create just a pile of them. And then you have the cards which I can show you the breakdown in the rules here. Uh, they have two different, well three different uses. They can either be used as movement point factors, as battle points in combat, or for their event. Otherwise, though, it's pretty much a CDG-style game in the classic uh, tradition, more or less, with the extra number in there. Um, which is strange to me because Berg kind of, as far as I'm concerned, kind of tried to avoid the CDGs for a long time. He tried to make something, uh, you know, trying to project myself into his thinking. Uh, it feels to me like he made games that we're trying to capture and create the same kind of excitement CDGs did, but his own brand of that. Uh, and they never really caught on any of them particularly heavily. Okay, 
Um, at the beginning of the game, you set up the pieces. Well, I've already done that. Most of them are on the turn record chart just because of the nature of this particular uh, situation. There's a couple of U.S. units marching down the road. Um, everybody then is going to get a hand of cards. And this is kind of strange. Each battle has its own deck uh, so that they can uh, more specifically tailor uh, the maneuvers, etc., in a particular battle to within the cards. That seems clever to me, but it also seems a little wasteful. It seems like, you know, maybe there would be a way of on the front of the cards uh, so that, it, you know, it doesn't mar the back and let you know what you're getting, um, saying, hey, Freeman's Farm only or Lundy's Lane only and have a standard deck uh, that goes with it. With only two battles, that probably isn't that big a deal, but I know one of the sets, the one with Queenstown, has a significant number of battles in it, and maybe there they took that kind of advice. I don't know. Certainly not for me, because I hadn't thought of it yet. Uh, but anyway, each turn, each player gets a certain number of cards, and it varies based on, you know, just the situation on the outside uh, of the battle or whatever, you know, to indicate uh, the command and control and everything that's going on in, in the army. Um, and then you check to see who goes first, uh, which is normally done by a random draw from the deck. Uh, whoever gets the highest movement point goes first. I may use a die roll instead. Should have the same general effect. Uh, you reshuffle the decks each turn, I believe. Um, and then that player uh, has to undertake a player round. However, special scenarios will say, for example, in Freeman's Farm, the English start with the initiative and there is for some reason a mail truck outside my house it's sunday what's up with that if he knocks on the door i'll have to pause this i think it's sunday uh, <laughs> okay so uh the basic course of play uh you're going to play, okay, so there's a number of player rounds that make up a turn, and they basically are your hand of cards that you get to play out. But unlike most games, you don't just play a card and do something. You have the opportunity to play anywhere from zero to five of your cards. If you play zero, it counts as a pass, and if both people pass in a row, the turn's over. Um, when you finish your turn, your your side of the round, uh, your round, then the other player gets to go, and uh, he gets to do the same thing, and you keep going until uh, both players pass consecutively. If only one person has cards to play, the other person gets one last chance to play up to five of their cards, which they don't have to play. I'm really curious about this mail truck. Um, huh. What the fuck's going on there? Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be Okay. Um, so each card is going to be used for one thing, either the event on it, uh, the movement points, or the battle points. You declare what use you're going to use it for, and then you can't use another card until you've uh, finished that usage. If the card's played for movement points, you have to use at least one of the movement points on it. Uh, some cards can be played during the opponent's round. These don't count against what you can play. There's indeed a mailman in that truck. Uh, uh, these don't count against the cards that you can play in your upcoming round or anything, uh, but they do count against your hand limits. So if you spent one, you won't get you know get a replacement or anything for it. Uh, okay, movement not as clearly explained as it might be, and it's a very very simple game. Uh, basically, when you play a card, you're able to move a piece that many, well, you're able to move pieces that many movement points. And a movement point is in general one point to go forward, one point to turn, and turning is where it's not completely uh, well explained. It doesn't say whether it's just 90 degree turns or 180. 
uh, are allowed um, off that one movement point. You're only allowed to move to turn twice uh, and there's actually a terrain effects chart here which gives the movement point cost so for example if you're moving through non-clear or road terrain uh, you'd have to pay more. There's a lot of woods on here those cost two movement points to cross those hex sites. You can only move directly in front of you you can't move diagonally or anything like that. Um, now, there's a limit to how many points you can spend off a card on a given unit. All right? Now, an infantry is only allowed the movement points. Okay, so this is again stated kind of oddly. It's limited to the maximum movement points available on a single played card. I don't know if that means that you know, you could combine cards for a given infantry as long as you had one high movement card that you played for that round. Or elsewhere, it seems to have it written in such a way that maybe uh, you play one card for the infantry. Again, a lot of ambiguity here in these rules. Uh, cavalry are allowed to play, can combine the movement point of two or more cards. That's that's kind of the, the opposite view of it. So the one side seems to say, okay, as long as I play a high enough card, I can move all my infantry that speed using up movement points from other cards. So if I played a six card, if such exists, I seem to remember this was fairly high, I could use six movement point for all, any of my infantry as long as I pay them from the pool of movement points that I generate. I don't think that's what's intended. I think what's intended is you play a card, you can move an infantry the amount allowed on that card, and that's all. But a bit of uh, confusion as to how it's worded. Um, units uh, move across the sides. They can move past but not through enemy units. A weird rule there too. Uh, I think basically it's a there's no zone of control rule, but with a simple uh, starter game like this, I don't know why anybody would think that you could move pa that you couldn't move uh, adjacent to enemy units and walk by them. Whatever. I could see that being confusing to people who are reading it. What what does that mean? Uh, uh, once a unit stops movement, you can't move it again that round, i.e. you can't use another card to activate it, is essentially. But it could be used in an attack in that round. You can move it later in the turn when <coughs> you've got another set of cards to play, uh, which could affect things. And what we might see is some sort of chess-like movement, trying to position a bunch of units so that a couple of cards can move them all. Uh, when reinforcements come on, they're going to come... Uh, they enter on the squares indicating using the cards for movement in the normal way. So here's the square indicated, right? O15. Hmm. Where are the Brit oh Brits are at A4. Um they can't just pile up there, so I think you have to move them on the map using movement points. Again, not specified there. Uh, because there is no stacking in this game, except for if you're playing with optional leaders or artillery. Those are allowed to stack, and we'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, so here's the uh, unit may change facing only two sides during any single round, regardless of how many movement points it spends. What I found weird about that is it talks about turns or change facing, but it doesn't talk about them as a 90 degree turn. So I think for one movement point, you can turn 180 degrees, but then you won't be allowed another turn, uh, another uh, complete facing change, uh, any kind of facing change in that round. Um, and then there's a facing roll, and that doesn't really help describe it. It just shows the difference between flank and rear, which may have modifiers on the battle table. Indeed it does. Okay. <clears throat> After you play cards for movement, or if you play a card for action, you're allowed to launch an attack. You cannot attack unless you've played at least one card for either of the other purposes. Uh, you can't play a card for battle points to allow you to attack, for example. Um, 
And an attack is defined by the target. All the units that are adjacent and facing it can hit it at once. Uh, you can make more than one attack per round, but only one uh, attack per card or group of cards played. So if I play a card or I play a couple cards to set up an attack, I can make that attack, but then I can't immediately jump over and make another attack until I've played another card for movement or event. Uh, you determine the battle points, which is essentially going to be the combat strength of the units involved uh, compared to each other. Um, however, they get modified by a number of things. For example, in terrain, you'll see some of them give like defending battle points doubled. And also from positional or elite bonus. The elite bonus is, I believe, the star. It says card play doubles elite unit. I'm assuming there's a card that does that. We'll see when we play, right? Um, okay. And then... Uh, Let's see. You're also allowed to throw cards into the battle to add to the total battle points of those units. The attacker and defender play their cards face down. Um, they must stay with <coughs> the attacker has to stay within his five card limit, which means if he plays a lot to do movement, he's not going to have many battle cards left that he can throw into the actual combat. That is a definite defensive advantage in the game that. Uh, is of some interest. Then when you resolve the battle, you total your battle points as listed above. Um, and yeah, somewhere there's a die roll here. Right. Actions, terrain leaders. Huh. I don't see a die roll. I thought there was one. Okay, I guess there is no die roll in this game. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, the cards are, are kind of your, your, your randomizer here for the battle. Um, if the attacker has more battle points but less than twice the defender, the defender has a choice usually to either retreat or to take a, a casualty. If he can't take, retreat, he takes a casualty. And casualties are either going to be the elimination of, of a unit or flipping the unit over to its reduced side. If the unit's reduced already, it gets eliminated. If it doesn't have a reduced side, it gets eliminated, but otherwise one casualty uh, knocks it down a level. If the attacker has twice as many battle points as the defender, uh, whether disordered or not, the defender must reduce and retreat. Disordered units that reduce are no longer disordered. Uh, did we have reduction in here? Yeah, if the defender was disordered prior to the battle, he must reduce. Uh, the unit. He's not allowed to just retreat. The attacker must advance into the vacated hex with one of his attacking units, if there is such. And the attacking unit can change facing with no cost of movement points. All other victorious units can change facing. If the defender is the winner, nothing happens unless the defender has twice or more the total battle points, in which case uh, the attacking unit will end up being reduced. Oh, when units are reduced, we talked about that. Units can become disordered due to artillery fire cards. While disordered, uh, they may not attack. A disordered unit that loses a battle is required to reduce. Uh, a unit that retreats moves into a vacant square in its rear or flank. It may only retreat forward as a last result. If it doesn't have a vacant square to retreat, it suffers an additional reduction, uh, and then it's allowed to re uh, change facing for free. We have the victory points in here. Uh, every time you kill units, you're going to get victory points. And you get them for victory locations. The locations are going to be the colored stars. Those are goals for uh, that player. Let's face it this way. <laughs> I believe. Uh, yeah, because the Brits are coming on the map from here. The Americans from here. So these are the locations the Brits want to take. Those are the locations the Americans want to take. Um, 
the number in the stars its victory point value and eliminated units victory points is equal to its full strength battle points. One player wins the instant the other player has lost the number of battle points for that battle. Well, in Freeman's farm, the game goes to the end no matter what, and whoever has the most victory points at that point wins. There are rules for playing at solitaire. Basically what you do is you play it as normally, but you pick the army cards kind of at random as to what you're going to do. I don't feel like that's going to give much view of the game. This may not be much fun to play solitaire by the normal rules, but at least you'll get to see the kind of decision making people are making. And I can throw some randomization in there to make it a little bit more interesting to me. I don't see randomizing the entire cards that you get to use and, and how you get to choose to use them to be uh, particularly uh, a pleasing design choice. So I'm not going to do that. I don't think this is a game that's designed for solitaire play at all, even with those. So we'll see uh, at least some flavor of how this works, you know. Maybe I'll decide that the system is just too painful solitaire to bother with the Lundy's Lane scenario. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm working on the rules of something much more painful after this. So <laughs> I may want to delay that by playing another scenario of this or maybe playing something longer that I'll just put that off into the uh, long future, but I really should get it played. All right, let's end this up.